Why are wild canids stronger than domestic ones? Dogs are man's best and oldest friend, as the saying goes. We have lived side by side for thousands of years, allowing us to achieve many great things together. Thanks to our influence and breeding, modern domestic dogs come in all shapes, shades, and sizes, with various breeds having different kinds of strengths, attributes, and traits. At the same time, the wild canines we didn't tame and domesticate are still out there in the wildlands of the world, thriving and living very much like the ancestors of our pet pooches. In fact, it often seems like wild canines are tougher and stronger than many domestic dogs thanks to their tenacity, endurance, and killer instinct. But is this true? Are wild canids stronger than domestic ones? And if so, why and how? Well, that's what we're here to talk about in today's video. So sit back, relax, and let's dive right in. Wild Canid The word canid refers to any member of the canidae family, which is better known as the dog family. Canidae is part of the carnivora order alongside felidae, the cat family, and ursidae, the bear family. When it comes to wild canids, we have several species distributed throughout the world's major continents. The only continent without a native wild dog species is Antarctica. The wild side of the dog family is quite diverse, with around 37 species and even more subspecies. Notable examples of wild canids are wolves, jackals, coyotes, foxes, dingoes, and African wild dogs. As carnivores, these animals are specialist meat eaters, though omnivorous tendencies are not uncommon. Almost all species hunt for their food using different techniques and strategies to tackle a variety of prey. Of course, scavenging is also a big part of survival for most of them. As a whole, wild dogs go after insects, reptiles, amphibians, rodents, rabbits, primates, and more. Some species even hunt especially large prey, like elk, caribou, and wildebeest. Of course, prey options are often dictated by how big the dog in question is. The smallest species, like the desert-dwelling fennec fox Vulpes zerda, mainly go after little critters – bugs, mice, small birds, and lizards. Larger species, like the gray wolf Canis lupus have a broader menu that includes large ungulates and even other predators, including other canids. So just how big do wild dogs get? Well, the gray wolf ranks as the biggest wild canid on Earth today. However, their size ranges quite a bit depending on location, time of the year, and sex. Body length ranges from 41 to 63 inches, excluding the tail. Shoulder height is 31 to 33 inches while body weight is anywhere between 26 and 175 pounds. In contrast, the fennec fox has a maximum body length of 15.6 inches and a max weight of just over 4 pounds. Canids are descended from caniform or dog-like mammals that emerged after the downfall of the Cretaceous dinosaurs 66 million years ago. The first true prehistoric dog, Prosperaceon, lived around 40 million years ago and its fossils were unearthed in modern-day Texas. Between Prosperaceon and the wild dogs we have today was a series of fascinating prehistoric canids, like Epiceon, the biggest wild dog ever, and the dire wolf, which has now been popularized by Game of Thrones. Wild canids are special animals because of how adaptable they are. Today, you can find wild dogs in forests, open grasslands, swamps, deserts, frozen tundras, and alpine regions. Some species, like the coyote, have even managed to settle and thrive within and around urban areas. Various species have incredible environmental adaptations, from winter-resistant coats to heat-dispelling ears. All canids are equipped with some of the keenest senses in nature. Their sight, hearing, and sense of smell are all top-tier, and are major reasons why humans domesticated them in the first place. We also can't ignore their athleticism, which includes high running speed, prodigious endurance, jumping, and even decent swimming prowess. Climbing is a notable weakness, though, and is one area where cats have them well and truly beat. Another great strength of canids is their social dynamics. Many species often live and move together as pairs, while others take it a step further and form bands or packs. Wolves are almost synonymous with pack life, and they live according to a rigid hierarchy that has an alpha male and female pair at the top. African wild dogs, Lycaon pictus, also live in packs and sometimes form groups with up to 100 members. 
Naturally, living in packs has its perks. One of the main ones is the ability to tackle larger prey than any individual can manage alone. Packs also provide warning and protection against larger predators and are a more efficient way to defend territory. That said, sometimes canids can go at it alone. Many foxes, coyotes, and holes often travel and hunt solo, especially in areas where food resources are limited. Even wolves can roam by themselves when they don't have a pack. Regardless of the specific social dynamics, all wild canids are alert animals who always keep their noses on the ground for both opportunities and threats. Despite their near-global distribution, though, wild canids are often not apex predators in their native environments. Wolves are the major exception, though, but even they sometimes have to vacate the top spot for certain bear and big cat species when they overlap. Most other wild canids have to worry about bears, cats, wolves, hyenas, and even birds of prey. Domestic Canids Domestic canids, or domestic dogs, are domesticated descendants of the gray wolf. Yep, even your fluffy little Pomeranian is more closely related to fierce gray wolves than to the equally fluffy Arctic fox, Vulpes lagopus. To be honest, no one is 100% sure how, where, and when humans first truly domesticated dogs. Speculators estimate sometime between 20,000 and 40,000 years ago, which isn't entirely helpful. The oldest confirmed remains of domestic dogs were found in Germany and date back to 14,000 years ago. As for the how, the leading theory is that wolves caught on to the fact that following humans around would lead to easy scavenging. In turn, these early humans learned to communicate and socialize with them, eventually spawning a mutual relationship where dogs lent us their senses and hunting abilities in exchange for regular food and shelter. Over time, different groups of people bred dogs for various purposes. Trait-based selective breeding produced different kinds of dogs. Some were bred for top speed, while others were bred for endurance. Others were bred for guarding and protective instincts, while others were bred for war. Humans even bred dogs to tackle specific prey, like birds, rabbits, or ungulates. Eventually, humans also started breeding dogs for aesthetics and cuteness. Some were even cherished status symbols reserved for the rich or the royal. Today, we have well over 360 internationally recognized breeds and maybe a million more crossbreeds and mongrels. This means they are much more diversified than their wild cousins in size, coloration, coats, and even personality. We have dog species like the aforementioned Pommy or French Bulldog, whose roles mostly involve being loving, cuddly pets. Then we have working dogs, which can be pets too but were originally bred for certain jobs. Mastiffs, for example, were bred to hunt robust prey and guard property from thieves or predatory animals. Jack Russell Terriers are great at being cute pets, but they are even better at catching and killing vermin. Huskies were bred for the teamwork, strength, and endurance required to haul sleds for hundreds of miles. Dogs also work on farms, helping herd and guard livestock. Our police and militaries use them for apprehending criminals or sniffing out drugs and bombs. Dogs even play a critical role in medical care and looking after disabled folks in the community. Medical service dogs do everything from guiding the blind, reminding diabetics to take their meds, and simply providing emotional support. Some are even trained to dial 911 or other emergency numbers. Unfortunately, a lot of domestic dogs also find themselves ownerless or homeless due to being abandoned or any other reason. These stray dogs live off the land, scraping whatever living they can in their given environment. Stray dogs are often a public nuisance because they raid rubbish sites, overbreed and produce more strays, and even attack people's pets or people themselves. While stray dogs are known to resort to their ancestral habit of forming packs among themselves, most domestic dogs are predisposed towards forming bonds with people. Ideally, a dog's pack leader is its human owners or handlers, though some boisterous breeds will sometimes challenge and test people to see if they are strong enough to lead. This is why most first-time owners are discouraged from getting headstrong breeds like the Cane Corso or Presa Canario. The largest breed is fairly debatable, but most experts rank the English Mastiff as number one. Grown males are at least 30 inches tall at the shoulder and weigh up to 230 pounds, while females are about 27 inches tall with a max weight of 175 pounds. This breed is a guarding and hunting breed, 
used to protect homes and farms, or tackle deer and wild boar. On the opposite end of the size spectrum is the Chihuahua, which weighs between 4 and 6 pounds when fully grown. Today, this breed is an iconic status symbol, but they were originally bred as a food source, and sometimes as ritual sacrifices. Are wild canids stronger than domestic ones? Well, it varies depending on the specific wild canid species and domestic dog in question. Gray wolves, for instance, are larger and hardier than most domestic dogs. Wolves are often apex predators, renowned for tenacity, ferocity, and teamwork. They kill many domestic dogs through violence and are resistant to certain viruses and bacteria that would cause issues for many pet dogs. That said, smaller species like jackals and even coyotes are smaller and not as robust as large dog breeds like boar bulls and conicorsos, which are bred to take on such predators. There's almost no way a cornered fox would win a one-on-one -on -one fight with a pit bull or boar bull. However, for the most parts, wild canids are better survivors than domestic dogs because they are not as reliant on humans. They understand that their survival depends on their ability to find and hunt food, avoid predators, and establish fruitful home ranges. Domestic dogs often rely on getting fed, sheltered, being taken to the vet, and generally cared for by humans. Sure, strays can survive on their own, but that is often a suboptimal existence. The harsh reality of the wild means that only the toughest, fastest, and strongest wild canids survive to pass on their genes. As such, on average, a wild canid has greater endurance, tracking, and hunting skills than an average domestic dog. We also have to look at the cost dogs have paid to befriend humans. In order to be friendly and loving companions, dogs have had to forego the aggression and edge required to survive in the wild. Essentially, breeding has taken away a lot of the power, stamina, and cunning that typifies wild canids.